Welcome to the Intentional Clinician Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Kraus, licensed professional counselor. It is my absolute honor to bring you this interview today with Dr. Margaret Chisholm, a professor, vice chair for education, and director of the Paul McHugh Program for Human Flourishing, all within the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Services at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. She has a secondary appointment in the Department of Medicine, and she is a board certified in general psychiatry and addiction medicine. She has over three decades of clinical experience in both general and specialized psychiatric outpatient and inpatient settings and has served as a PI or co-investigator on multiple NIDA and foundation-funded research projects. She has published over 100 scientific, clinical, and medical education articles and books and chapters on substance use in pregnancy and other psychiatric disorders, as well as the use of social media and the arts and humanities in medicine. She is the author of a psychiatric textbook and a book on psychiatric illnesses for patients and families. From Survive to Thrive, Living Your Best Life with mental illness. It's an interactive guidebook for patients and their family members, or just about anyone, searching for a path toward greater well-being. And there's so much more you could say about Dr. Chisholm. She's been involved in so many uh, different organizations and has received so many awards, one of which is the twice recognized as the Arnold P. Gold Foundation Humanism Scholar, And she was a recipient of the 2014 Johns Hopkins University Alumni Association Excellent in Teaching, among other things. And today we are going to talk about the state of mental health treatment in the United States. We're going to talk about ways that people can go from just surviving to thriving and actually flourishing in their life. And we're going to talk about some of the research behind um, the assertions we're discussing in this podcast And we're going to talk about stories of hope. And so I really think you're going to enjoy this interview. Just before I play the interview, I want to tell you a little bit about what I've been up to. Basically, I just released in the spring my first online course for parents of young adults, What Do We Do Now? The course is almost three hours long and has six modules that go over many things that will help the parents of young adults, such as identifying emergencies, working on how to understand young adults in today's society, working on, for the parents, communication patterns, boundaries, uh, ways to reduce antisocial behaviors and promote pro-social behaviors, and what do you do if your young adult has an addiction, and of course, how to get connected to the proper professionals for your situation, and that's available on Udemy right now, and they're always running sales. Uh, the other item is that I am affiliated with EMDR Training Solutions. So if you're a clinician looking to get trained at EMDR, these are some of the best trainers in the business, and they've been training people for years. This organization is relatively new, but the trainers themselves have been professionals um, working for various organizations and doing excellent training for many years. Um, and they gave me a code, the word intentional. If you use that at checkout, you get $100 off of your EMDR training, and I highly recommend that. All right, let's get to the interview. Welcoming to the show, Dr. Margaret Chisholm, and I appreciate you coming on The Intentional Clinician. I'm really excited to be here chatting with you today. It's a great yes. honor. Wonderful. And I am excited to tell everyone about your book that you are launching from Survive to Thrive, Living Your Best Life with Mental Illness. And uh, being a doctor who wrote a book, I am just curious, what are some of your inspirations uh, for this book? It's a great question. I mean, I was in private practice for a long time before I joined the full-time faculty at Hopkins. And I was trained in a way of thinking about psychiatric illness that uh, no one had written about for patients. And so I would often explain what kind of psychiatrist I am. That's what most people ask, you know, what's your orientation? And so I sort of explain how I was trained and the way I think about psychiatric problems. And I thought it would be great to have a resource to give to patients. So for over 20 years, this book has been in my mind. I first wrote a book for clinicians on the same topic and then decided to 
turn that book and some of the pearls from that book into a, a more accessible book for patients and their families to help them understand this way of looking at psychiatric problems and then actually going beyond the psychiatric problems aspect of, of one's life to how to be uh, with going beyond the psychiatric problems in one, one's life to learning how to live one's life to the fullest, despite or sometimes even because of psychiatric illness. Well, that's excellent. I think that it sounds like a great deal of time and effort was put into this over the years. And I think that's great that you've written this book. And I'm curious about, just for the listeners uh, who listen to this show they, a lot of them are looking for answers. A lot of them are clinicians as well, but kind of, could you explain a little bit about the paradigm of how you view mental illness and, and the treatment of mental illness? So Hopkins psychiatry for the last 30 years or so, um, has used a model, a conceptual model called the perspectives of psychiatry. And it's sort of an armature on which, uh, we, think about psychiatric problems when patients come to us. And really this model just makes explicit what you know that you do every day implicitly, which is thinking about patients as in a whole kind of way, as whole people, and thinking about the possible sources of their problems. And so this approach really just systematizes this way of thinking about psychiatric problems so that we think when a patient comes to us, we look at their uh, psychiatric problems from different perspectives. That's why it's called the perspectives of psychiatry approach. So we would think about a patient um, and think how much of what they're experiencing now that's troubling them is because of something they have, like a disease that's come upon them unbidden. How much are they experiencing that has something to do with who they are as a person, um, their personality, their cognitive gifts? How much of what is causing them trouble now is because of something they're doing, restricting their food intake, um, engaging in repetitive self-harm, using substances, and how much of what they're experiencing is due to what they've encountered in their life, the stories that they're telling themselves, the meaning that they're giving to events in their life. And, you know, if we ask patients when they come, which often we do, uh, you know, how much of what's going on is, do they think is something they have or who they are, et cetera. A lot of times patients will say, well, all of that. And uh, so these aren't mutually exclusive explanations for a problem, but it's a way of looking at the patient's problems and thinking about how best to approach all of these from different angles. And so, um, so that's basically the model, the perspectives of psychiatry, you know, is thinking about whether or not a patient is, um, their problems are best explained as a disease, as um, something that's growing out of their personality, as something that's emerged from um, what they're doing or what they've encountered. Okay, yeah, I, I think that's a very holistic model. It takes into a lot of a lot of things into account, and I I like that a lot because there has been kind of in the pop culture realm of psychology, sort of this easy answer to what is depression. It's a chemical imbalance. That's it. That's it. That's what it is. And while it may be a chemical imbalance or a lack of serotonin, we, uh, in some context, there's also multiple other layers of the disease of depression and also the personality integration, the environmental context, the diet, the, um, this, the traumatic events that may have uh, in, impacted this person. And then, of course, all of those things sort of working together to form a repetitive thought pattern um, that we see in depression uh, uh, that you can see in the DSM-5, um, these sort of persistent thoughts and these sort of similar behaviors that people have when they have depression. So I think that that 
the model you're talking about, this prospectus of psychiatry is a model that I think a lot of um, Americans uh, or just anybody that goes and sees a doctor would hope that their doctor is considering all these factors. But due to managed care, oftentimes people say, well, I only have 15 minutes with my psychiatrist and uh, there's so much to say. And we've got to check in on my symptoms first and see how the medication's working. Um, so I, I would just, I'm wondering about, I guess I'm just bringing in uh, this this notion of of simplification that you hear sort of in, in pop psychology on talk shows or commercials, how that may be impacting people's view of different mental illnesses. Um, anything yeah, I think there? there's yeah, there's a lot of things that are impacting, you know, how people's how therapists or doctors and and the culture at large kind of view psychiatric problems. I think that uh, you know people are complicated, and um, and it's hard to it takes time <laughs> to understand people. Uh, it, you know, you do have to take a, a, a pretty thorough history, uh, in-depth history to really get to know um, someone. And sometimes it takes many months to get a grasp of what somebody's personality is really. Um, so it, it takes a, it takes time, it takes uh, effort. And it, I guess, is you also need to know what to do with what you find, right? And so a lot of people, um, it's easy to give a pill to solve a problem, but it, uh, you know, often is is insufficient or inadequate to really address um, the complexities uh, of that people bring to us. So, you know, I, I, I see a lot of a lot of complicated patients. I think I'm not alone in that. Um, and even something as relatively perhaps simple as a, as a disease um, is taking place in the context of a person who has a personality, who has, um, you know, has lived a life, has a, have, has a life story. And so they give that disease meaning uh, depending on, on what they've experienced in life and who they are. And it, all these are interacting and it ju just giving a pill is often inadequate. I think even for the most straightforward, simple diseases. And we know this through the, you know, the scientific evidence that people with the disease of depression uh, are, are more likely to get better from that illness with a combination of psychotherapy and pharmacotherapy. Yes, there was a very extensive meta-analysis released by the American Psychological Association for sure a couple of years ago, maybe 10 years ago, that said uh, the efficacy of recovery improves, I don't remember, a giant percentage, you can look the study up, um, if you combine pharmacotherapy with uh, psychotherapy. And I think that was a really big clue in the research, uh, in the meta-analysis of the research to kind of help us join forces um, balancing the biological systems with some of the, you know, the things that I guess I would say the the whole life picture that a, a lot of doctors who are very busy don't have time to do psychotherapy, which is a whole hour with one person, you know, every week in the outpatient model. Um, and uh, I know back in, I think, I don't know, a long time ago, let's say 70 years ago, psychiatrists were also doing psychotherapy. Um, as well, I think it's just the demand for services has skyrocketed, and thus it, the two professions split apart. It was part of it, and uh, sort of looking at things a little differently in the 1970s really split. And now I think we're trying to figure out how to work as a team, and I think that's that is the best model to take is to have multiple. And and of course, I mean, I even go further. Um, if I work with a client with post traumatic stress disorder, oftentimes I will try to get them into physical therapy for their pain. Uh, they have a lot of times physical pains um, that may be related to patterns of muscle holding due to emotional distress. So we have psychiatry already, we have the therapy, and then we have also got the physical therapy going on. Um, so yeah, I think that for anyone out there that's sort of puzzled by what is mental illness and, and how do you, how, you know, what's going on with the mind and what's the best treatment, 
it is important to get multiple perspectives. And um, go ahead. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um, uh, there are some psychiatrists that still do their own psychotherapy, or you know, I work with therapists as part of a team, mm -hmm. but I also, for some patients, am conducting psychotherapy with them. So, you know, and I think the pressures. Yes, in some ways, it's because there's inadequate resources and maybe more people need psychiatric services. But I think sometimes it's market driven. Mm -hmm. um, you know, psychiatrists can make a lot more money seeing patients for quick medication visits uh, than for psychotherapy visits. So, um, you know, so I, I don't think it's I think there's still an option for psychiatrists to do psychotherapy if, if they want to. And, and for some patients, I think it's it's um, more advantageous to have uh, a single person. I think for many patients, it's more advantageous to have teams of people. But I, I like having the option. I, I find psychotherapy still really an interesting part of, of my work. So... Well, that is great to hear. I think you're one of the first psychiatrists I've met that still performs psychotherapy. And I, I love that. Um, I think it, I, I know that they all have the skills. I mean, every doctor I've met, I mean, I believe it's in their scope, you know, to do this. It's just that they, they are not, not many do. So I think that that's wonderful because then you can sort of see, you know, you can sort of get into the story and oftentimes, um, uh, the person taking some small actions it can really make a big difference over time. Um, so I, I'm curious about uh, your teaching as well. Um, can you talk a little bit about what you're doing at John Hopkins? Johns Hopkins. Yeah. So, so at Johns Hopkins, uh, well, I'm vice chair for education in our department of psychiatry. So I basically see all the teaching that goes on from the medical students through the residents and um, the, the uh, postgraduate fellows like uh, in child psychiatry or uh, geriatric psychiatry, things like that. So um, I'm involved in teaching psychiatry um, trainees, but I'm also involved in teaching at the medical school at large. So um, I run a program for medical students who are interested in the the concept of human flourishing. So um, I have a, a small group of students that are in this longitudinal program, not, not an official track, uh, but where they get uh, mentoring around the um, quest, the big questions, you know, what does it mean to be a physician? <laughs> what does it mean to be human? Those kinds of things. Um, my goal really is to help all patients be treated with respect and dignity. And so as a psychiatrist and someone who worked for 10 years at the Center for Addiction and Pregnancy with uh, drug-dependent pregnant women, I've really seen uh, stigma <laughs> at, written large, and it still happens throughout healthcare. And so trying to advocate for those patients, um, you know, it was from my interest in wanting to advocate for those patients that I have developed uh, my work in with medical students in general, um, so that our patients get treated well uh, throughout the medical system. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. I think that is a interesting segue because I want to learn more about this, this philosophy that you're teaching, because I think that's so important. It, it's sort of, I don't want to, I don't want to label it, but it reminds you of sort of a humanistic, you know, like kind of like the whole picture of psychiatry, but like a humanistic way for the person to be a doctor, but also to treat people. And I, I've worked in multiple systems. I've worked in Chicago's mental health system. I worked in Phoenix's public mental health system, uh, Phoenix, Arizona. And now I'm in private practice and run a clinic. And I, I have seen the same thing you're seeing, which is what well, you've seen, which is there is a stigma about certain patients that come in and sort of an sometimes a knee-jerk reaction by providers, which can be uh, unfortunate devastating to the patient um and and almost like a loss of I, I think this might happen from burnout too like a loss of belief that they could actually get better which is completely actually against all of the research <laughs> all of the research shows that if people are engaging in treatment i mean psychotherapy and 
uh, in psychiatry, especially multiple treatments, that they get better at the rate for psychotherapy. I think in Dr. Wampold's book was 0.79. And I think psychiatry and therapy, I wish I had the study in front of me, was way over that. So um, can you talk a little bit about the, how important this philosophy is about human flourishing? Um, it reminds me a little bit about of positive psychology, but this idea of languishing versus flourishing, some of your philosophy around that. Yeah, so uh, just to back up a bit, I do think that our, you know, our patients are highly stigmatized, even there's even pecking orders within psychiatric illness and even within addiction. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's so important to help medical trainees or and physicians um, or health professionals of all kinds to view our patients with respect and dignity. I do think the fact that so many of our healthcare professionals are trained in acute care settings where they see people at their very worst um, and they don't see the, um, the, the great stories, the hopeful stories. Um, you know, when I tell people that I, when I tell people that I've seen patients literally who have been sex workers and IV drug users who are now full professors, literally. Um, it's astounding. I think people are um, in the healthcare profession don't really see all the success stories. Often I'm asked, you know, isn't psychiatry a depressing field? And I'm like, no, it's, <laughs> you know, people get better. Um, there's always hope. Um, and so, yeah, so I, I think that uh, people in the healthcare profession have a skewed view of, of, uh, of these illnesses and these problems and, and these patients. So, um, so one of the things that I'm working on is helping people um, treat everyone with respect and dignity. And it boils down to this question of what does it mean to be human? <laughs> um, and what you know is the aim of being a healthcare professional what are what's our goal what's the meaning what gives us meaning and purpose and i think what i think i think that part of our job is to help people lead the fullest lives that they can it doesn't end with just getting somebody over their acute physical illness or their acute mental illness it's actually helping them go on to reach their fullest potential. In order to do that, you really have to <laughs> kind of dip into this area of philosophy, which is, you know, what does it mean to lead a good life? What's, what is, what does flourishing look like? Um, I think that, um, you know, for this, I've really turned to the work of Tyler Vanderweel, who's at Harvard. He's an epidemiologist who's looked at big epidemiologic databases, these longitudinal studies of large groups of people. And um, he's looked at what, how they define uh, a good life and what evidence there is for what helped them achieve a good life. And so the domains of a, a good life that he describes, domains of flourishing, are happiness and life satisfaction, mental and physical health, meaning and purpose, character and virtue, and close social relationships. He, there's also a variable of material, financial security or stability, which of course is important um, for all of us. And what he's found is that there are four pathways to flourishing. And this is from the scientific evidence. These are causal links. This isn't just associations. And those pathways are family, community, particularly religious community, um, in part because on the, in these law, large epidemiologic data sets, they typically, that's one of the few communities that they ask about, mm -hmm. um, education and work. And it's those pathways. So just like I look at people through those through the four perspectives, is this something they have or something they're, who they are as a person, what they're doing, what they've encountered. I also look at those pathways. You know, what is the relationship 
with their family? What is the, um, you know, what are they doing in terms of work? Those kinds of questions. And, you know, I found this with the, at the Center for Addiction and Pregnancy, that it was relatively easy to get women to stop using um, drugs, mainly heroin, during their pregnancy. There were lots of incentives um, to, to not do that. Um, but keeping them off of drugs long term or helping them stay off drugs long term is more challenging um, for various reasons. And so often in addiction, it's we ask them to engage with a community like AA um, where they can get that kind of support. We often, many of the patients have burned bridges with their families. We, you know, help support them in trying to rebuild those bridges as another source of support and meaning in their life. Um, many people haven't uh, achieved educationally what they would have liked to have achieved. So getting helping people get their GED or get back in uh, college and then uh, helping people find work because the only thing that's going to keep people well and help them reach their fullest potential is to have these other um, parts of their life be sort of competing positive reinforcers to the drug use, right? So having a sense of meaning and purpose, uh, reason to show up at a job, uh, you know, show up the next day for a job that um, for which you're getting paid, or knowing that somebody is depending on you at AA or in your faith community or your family, all those kinds of things bring more um, success and build on one another so that somebody can actually stay well. Uh, I often say to medical students, you know, you're complaining about this patient not following your recommendations to take their insulin, but why should they? They, you know, have no friends, no family, no job. They haven't had an education, so they can't even really um, kind of enrich their themselves on their own through reading or going to the museums or whatever. Um, what what meaning and purpose do they have in their life? They have no close social relationships. They have um, they're not satisfied with their life. What reason do they have to take the insulin? Um, so I think these pathways to flourishing and the flourishing domains are important for all of health, not just patients with psychiatric problems. Yes, I agree completely. And it seems like one of the things I've heard about in, I guess, just, I love that this is research backed. It reminds me a little bit of Dr. Dan Siegel's work uh, in at UCLA. He talks about healthy mind you know, activities. And I believe actually he named all of the ones that you were, all the domains you were naming, but these pathways to me are really interesting because um, in all of these pathways, there's a couple of components like family, community, education, work. There's, there's some com components in each of them. I'm sure he probably goes into this, but I was just noticing off the top of my head that there is a relationship with each of those things and there's meaning in each of those things, which are very basic building blocks. And I don't know if this is totally research driven, but one of my observations in psychology is isolation makes all of the symptoms that you may have had worse um, if you're isolated for a long time. And, and I know that during the pandemic when there was lockdowns, we saw crisis line uh, calls increasing, uh, increased, um, at least according to the consumer sector, increased sales of uh, alcohol, uh, marijuana where it's legal, um, increased prescriptions um, for various things. We saw in my clinic, I, I thought we were going to have less calls <laughs> because we were doing telehealth, which was uh, not everyone's favorite, but uh, we had more calls than we'd ever had before organically you know, driven from the internet and uh, you know referrals and um, so the the meaning and the relationship are just so key to to humans and when somebody has missing one of these 
factors, it's, it's like, it can be devastating. And then stress is, of course, another factor that we can measure. And at least in, in the psychology, we, according to, you know, things I've read in, in graduate school, stress can also exasperate symptoms such as anxiety, depression, um, hypervigilance, if you have some sort of post-traumatic stress. So telling people what they can do instead of just focusing on the negatives is, is what I'm also hearing you kind of illustrate like, Hey, it is complicated, but yet there are some research driven things you can do here to help improve your life. And we know this works. So how do we get you connected? And I, I remember that when I worked with people that had no resources or almost, I'm sorry, not none, but very few resources, monetary and very little connection, the rate of them sort of getting graduating, so to speak, therapy or getting to a place where they felt that they could see me less was much slower and uh, than when I worked in private practice with somebody who had a really good job and was connected to family uh, had a great education, um, was connected to various communities, whether it was religion or a bowling league or whatever. They seemed to just, I, I, I did some interventions um, and all of a sudden they're saying, you know, I don't know, 10, 15 sessions later, okay, well, this is great. I guess I'll see you once a month just to make sure I don't feel bad again. Whereas when people, uh, they'd have one of the things, you know, they'd have a family, but it was, there was a lot of dysfunction. They weren't connected to community. They didn't really have an education and they either had uh, underemployment or unemployment. Uh, they might see me for a year or two and we'd slowly outside of the, the sort of interventions of, you know, mental health that I was doing. We often worked on what I would just call basic goals, such as, okay, well, let's, Let's work on applying for jobs. That was just part of the session. Okay, let's, um, what can we get you connected to? And when they got connected and when they got a job, even if it wasn't the, their favorite job, I just I just noticed that in my practice, how, how they would all of a sudden say, okay, well, let's switch to every other week or, you know, I'm going to talk to my doctor about decreasing my Wellbutrin, you know, and it was just sort of this natural thing. And so um, I'm, I, I've seen that anecdotally, but I'm, 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 I'm glad to see that you've, you know, there, there is a lot of research on that. Um, I wanted to know um, maybe, maybe some stories uh, that you, that are, I don't know, intricate to your understanding of, of how you've decided to, you know, bring in these really cool, well, I think really cool factors of being human, not just, you know, the medical data. Uh, is there any stories that have inspired you to to do this uh, that led you to this? Well, you know, so much of my my inspiration comes from my patients, and um, you know, I, I don't want to share stories particularly to any one patient, but just in general, um, the patients that either have given me permission to write about them or the ones that um, we have kind of made amalgams of. In, in a couple of books, are, you know, these, these are stories of, of people who um, a lot of people had given up on uh, or who um, didn't seem to have, uh, you know, much uh, hope uh, or had a long journey ahead of them, uh, who've really gone far. I mean, there's this one patient um, who you know, has this devastating illness of schizophrenia. It's every parent's nightmare that their child would have this illness. I worked at a, a small private hospital in a day hospital for people with schizophrenia and would see, you know, tragically, you know, parents send their kids off to college and these, you know, mostly Ivy League kids in this place would come back uh, from college after a semester, a year, and, you know, have this illness that had basically extracted their personality. Um, and so, you know, what do you do in the face of that devastation? But, you know, working with patients over time, you do see uh, huge success stories. And this one patient that I'm thinking of as, you know, he now has um, a girlfriend, he's living independently, he has a job, 
Um, and although he was an extremely bright person um, and was, you know, at an elite college, uh, he still managed to go back to school, not that same school, and get a degree. Um, and, you know, he reads and uh, enjoys literature and um, he really leads a full life. It's not the same life that his, um, he imagined for himself or his parents thought that he was going to lead, but it's a really good life um, by all measures. He's, you know, happy. He has meaning, purpose, um, is physically well, just lost a lot of weight, actually. Um, so it's stories like that that give me inspiration because, I, you know, I don't think there are many diseases as um, that has, have as, you know, there aren't as many uh, diseases as serious as schizophrenia um, that many people consider this life sentence. And to see somebody who, even with that disease, is able to thrive and flourish, again, with these pathways, he had very supportive family. Um, you, you know, his, his sister got very involved with the uh, with NAMI, um, really educated herself, became quite an advocate. Um, he, um, you know, himself went back to school, got a job, um, and was part of the, he himself was part of the mental health community and the advocacy community. So um, those pathways are really predictive of success. And when a patient um, comes in, as you've said, that doesn't have uh, those, any connections within those pathways, it's a it's a poor prognostic sign, but it is our job to help them establish those connections to those pathways, strengthen those pathways, and they will reach their fullest potential. Um, some people don't think that's part of being a mental health professional, but I think it's part of being any kind of health professional is helping our patients' lives reach their greatest potential. And we we have that opportunity when we see a patient. Yes, um, I agree. I think we have an opportunity and a privilege. And I think, I'm not sure how to fully explain this, but one of the things I've said to my patients and clients over the years was, my job is to get you out of therapy, not keep you in it as a subscription. You know, there's so many people that want to come see a therapist now because um, luckily in the public, a lot of celebrities and people have written books about how it's okay to, you know, go through a period of depression or anxiety that is debilitating to you. And we all go through these things and it's sort of helped normalize it just over since I've graduated college um, in the last 20 years. So I've seen a huge shift in that because... But it's still, it just depends where you live and depends who you're around and what opinions you're kind of listening to. But it is much more open. And and I think that is our job is to is to get people to not only, you know, recover, but not not just palliatively, but to really see how can they pursue their dreams? Because then that that's a ripple effect. Um, these people can go out and inspire other people in their community and make those connections, sort of like the recovery community where somebody who was once having a major addiction or problem becomes a sponsor, they call it, of, of another person and takes them under their wing and informally and formally kind of coaches them on on the things that they they did and that personal story. And then they uh, in some states and places, they have what's called a peer support program where somebody who has had what we would call a persistent severe mental illness gets to the point where they've recovered, goes through this training, and then is a basically um, liaison and coach of uh, other people that are in that predicament. And uh, most, not always, but not not always, but often the four pathways uh, with the people that have persistent uh, severe mental illness are not there. The, the families disconnection or had abuse, uh, community, uh, not really much, or, or maybe they had a, a, a traumatic experience with the community and they've left it. Um, education isn't either they're not using it or something happened there. And then often problems with job stability or even having a job. So 
I'm curious where to go, but I, I, I have a lot of, you wrote so many good things here that I've just, there have, there's so many options, but <laughs> I, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, a couple of things. I want to talk about the life story and I would love to hear just a bit more about your perspective on the actual diagnoses, but I'm not sure on the labels that people get when they sometimes go in for treatment, but I'm not sure which one to go to first. <laughs> I'll, I'll talk about, um, well, I think that let's talk about the, uh, the labels, the diagnostic labels. I mean, one thing that the way I was trained, uh, at Hopkins was in this perspectives approach, which isn't really as much about diagnosing and is more about formulating. So we're trying to understand the origins of someone's problem or problems and help them recover from those acute problems and keep them well. So um, each one of those perspectives that I talked about, the disease perspective, the uh, dimensional perspective, which is our name for the personality perspective, the behavior perspective, um, and the life story perspective, each one of those perspectives is associated with a treatment goal. For disease, it's to remedy or cure. For um, the uh, dimensional or personality perspective, it's to guide uh, someone through life's provocations um, and help them respond differently. To For the uh, behavior perspective, we want to interrupt the behavior that pattern of behavior that's been reinforced by conditioned learning, which is limiting choice. Um, and uh, because the drive is, is so increased from conditioning. And then for the life story perspective, we really want to um, help rescript the meaning that someone has given to an event. So um, the perspectives approach really doesn't lend itself to just purely categorical thinking. Um, it's, again, it's a holistic approach. It really isn't rocket science. It, it's <laughs> almost common sense, uh, but but it's been eclipsed by the DSM approach. And, you know, the problem with the DSM approach, well, there are many problems with it, um, but, but one problem with the DSM approach is it's a it's a it's a list it's a grouping of categories and you know disease reasoning is really a categorical approach so even though it doesn't um it's atheoretical it's not saying these things are diseases or aren't diseases but just by using this categorical approach it implies or people infer um, that these are diseases you know, the DSM was developed for research purposes to ensure reliability in diagnosis so that if somebody in the UK saw a patient with this set of signs or symptoms that, and somebody in the US was doing research on that same population of patients or that same quote unquote disease or syndrome, that they would be talking about the same thing. So it was really designed for uh, reliability and research. And some of the categories in like the DSM three and four didn't even have reliability, like the personality disorder. Um, that's why they're clusters, you know, cluster A, B, and C. It's because individually within cluster B, histrionic, narcissistic, antisocial, borderline, none of those could be reliably distinguished from one another. <laughs> so there is, wasn't even good reliability. And then in the field trials of DSM-5, major depression didn't even have low reliability. So, you know, so that's one problem. Um, the other problem is that, well, it doesn't say anything about validity. Um, so that's another problem. But uh, another problem is that there's um, they're very non, there's lots of overlap, right? There's a lot of non-specific uh, signs and symptoms in these checklists. Um, and it doesn't tell you anything about the origin of someone's problems, which is really needed to treat it. You've got to know where it's coming from to be able to figure out how best to treat it. So for all those reasons, I think the DSM is highly 
highly inadequate, um, greatly overused. Um, and, you know, you, you've seen this, people come with 10 different DSM diagnoses or more. Uh, these are young people, <laughs> you know, somebody who's 25 years old. It's like, it, this is just, it's ludicrous and it's absurd and it undermines the credibility of mental health professionals, I think. I agree completely because as I've said, you can't take a blood test to prove that you're anxious. You know, it's not cancer. You know, you can't just, you know, you can't say it. These are, again, behavioral patterns and groupings that were used by doctors and now therapists to distinguish what we're talking about. But again, even major depression and general anxiety have overlap. And those are the two big ones that you get. And then in DSM-5, we had this huge fight which we won't get into because that's historical, but you can look it up about post-traumatic stress disorder and expanding trauma into multiple different categories. And, and I would like to say that, you know, one of the things I've really emphasized at my office is uh, trauma informed care and understanding how the trauma and the story have affected um, the person's uh, reaction. And then if you work on treating the trauma, usually not always, but can be the root, um, and with your interventions, oftentimes you'll see a lot of the depression, anxiety start to fade. And even if you can't prove that they have post-traumatic stress disorder, which is interesting. So with that, it reminded me the other day, and that I, this, I, this is just, I guess, a, a story that illustrates this. So we had a, uh, uh, there's somebody I know that had a client, I'm changing a lot of things right now. So no one will understand it. And somebody I was supervising and the client according to the story that I read, because I read the entire intake, I felt had massive amount of trauma from a few incidents that had happened over the last two years and probably wouldn't qualify for PTSD, but had so many symptoms of it, right? And a lot of them then, of course, looked like generalized anxiety disorder. Well, they needed to go for work or something to get some sort of you know, we're a therapist, we're master's level. So they had to go to a psychologist to get some sort of test done. And they, and they apparently a psychologist hardly interviewed them and just gave them a bunch of paper and pen tests. And they came out with like three or four diagnoses, which all overlapped. And then the worst one of all was avoidant personality disorder. And I said, you've got to be kidding me because the person was avoiding people due to the traumatic event that had occurred, but they weren't fully avoiding people. I mean, they still had a job and they still had friends, but they were on the test. Of course, they're writing, no, avoid, avoid, avoid. Well, (laughs) one of the biggest symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder is avoiding the stimuli of what caused the trauma. So I just, I, my eyes rolled back and like fell out of my head. And then I had to, my, the clinician had to explain to them that, they basically spent an hour, maybe more, explaining to them that these diagnoses are not, you know, these are these are observations. And in this case, it sounds like the psychologist didn't do due diligence in interviewing them and just gave them six tests or something to take. And and, and then it's like hearts, like, you know, they have a doctorate behind their name. We have a master's level, and yet, and then they needed it for work. So then, but then you give that to your work and they say, My God, you have four diagnoses this is insane you know i don't know if you could it's like this is putting this patient in this terrible position so um the good news is that the patient did calm down and apparently is realizing that you know while they got these sort of categorical diagnoses that they will have a chance at recovering in their life and are willing to participate in therapy and i think i think maybe the letter did help their job give them fmla uh, but uh family medical leave act but yeah, these these diagnoses can become an identity. They can become a blow. Um, I think, and and to basically most people who are clinicians, um, there's a stereotype of the wounded healer, and I think it's an, or an archetype, I suppose. And most people have experienced something really, really bad in their life um, that maybe put them into a period of time or even longer where they f- lost functioning in certain areas. And, and so I think that's another problem is that if you get this diagnosis, it's like, well, the diagnosis is on a spectrum. 
Sometimes, most people, <laughs> during the pandemic, I would say most people met about half of the criteria for either major depression or generalized anxiety disorder, but may, or maybe all of them. It's just they weren't meeting the categories that say, you know, uh, is impeding functioning for six months in these categories, but they had the symptoms short term acutely. Um, and people don't understand that. And so then all of a sudden it's like, I am a bipolar, I am a depressed person. And then when that happens, then you're really in trouble as a clinician, because we've taken this on to a whole nother level where I, and I get it with cancer. I'm a cancer survivor. I'm a cancer patient and I'm going to beat this cancer, right? Because it's, it's a foreign entity in my body. But if I've got depression and anxiety, it, it's almost like I'm, um, it's my fault. This is, I'm the problem. And I, I don't know, right. that's kind of how I was seeing that. What you were yeah, saying. Yeah, it really does become part of your identity, these labels. And, you know, sometimes that can be helpful. Often it can be not helpful. The, um, he, the personality disorder diagnoses, uh, we don't use those at Hopkins for the most part. We um, look at people on these dimensions. We use the five-factor model, the NEOPI. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, actually, some of us call the DSM personality disorder diagnoses as um, that's really just sophisticated name calling. If, if there's no reliability and there's no validity, that's just you know using fancy words to call people names. Um, so, but I think it's much more helpful to be able to say to someone, you know, look on this dimension of say, uh, strongly felt emotions and weakly felt emotions, which we'll call neuroticism, you know, your two standard deviations <laughs> from the mean high on strongly felt emotions so for you, that's your potential. And when you meet certain provocations, um, which some might be avoidable, um, but some might be unavoidable for the most part, like driving or waiting in line someplace, um, you know, your response in either your natural feeling is going to be whatever, rage or something. Um, and it's going to be very strongly felt. But you can learn to think differently. Um, and respond differently to those provocations. And let me help guide you through this process. To me, that's, and, and also you're not saying it's good or bad to be two standard deviations higher. You know, it's going to put you at more risk, but there's some benefits that come to being a very, you know, having a lot of strongly felt emotions. You know, poets have experienced these, actors have experienced the benefits of these. Um, it's just certain situations or provocations it's, it's going to be a liability. So I think that's just much more helpful to people to understand their where they are on these dimensions, to understand their personality, their affective temperament, so that they can then, uh, you know, not necessarily uh, label themselves as having some kind of disorder, but instead um, see that it has some strengths, their personality, and in certain situations, it has um, carries with it some vulnerabilities. I think it's, to me, it's it's much more positive and hopeful than being labeled with a personality disorder diagnosis. Yes, I agree with that completely, because like you were saying, actors and, and musicians and poets and things, you know, some of the most moving pieces of art or music or film or or even just a speech have come from people that have had enormous problems and maybe even diagnosis if you know these are most modern most of these diagnoses of course are modern but if you just look at history uh you know people that were inspirational they didn't just have this sort of peachy life where they were non-reactive and all of this i mean there was lots of reactivity and and, and different challenges so I, I i i like that and i think it's so much more holistic and i'm i'm hoping over time that your book and your perspective leaks more into the 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 mainstream narrative of of people um and i wanted to ask you know because we're, we're i want to really kind of emphasize some positive stuff here um you, you talk about the life story perspective 
how we can create our personal narratives and and how they help us cope with the turbulence of life or hinder us. Can you talk a little bit about that and and I guess also rewriting your life story? Yeah. So I mean, the the life story is quite interesting to me. And you you had mentioned trauma, and so you know, I I guess I will say this um, just to back up a little bit. Um, you know, I think there's a big inter- interaction between our personalities and our the meaning that we give certain events. Um, I had a patient that was on 9-11 uh, at one of the lower World Trade Center um, buildings when it went down, and he never lost a night of sleep. People halfway around the world had trouble sleeping. He didn't because he was of a certain personality Um you know, dimension in terms of weekly felt emotions Mm -hmm. (laughs) didn't really, you know, bother him. Um, So that was an example of how maybe that was adaptive for him being that way. Um, But I guess my point is that one person's potentially traumatic event is, um, you know, I think a potentially traumatic event can be uh, experienced as trauma by one person and not by another person in part, depending on their personality. But for most people, um, you know, the the life story perspective has this underlying uh, conceptual triad of setting, sequence, and outcome. So, you know, there's a setting of uh, a particular event, a sequence of events, and then uh, the outcome is the story basically that you're telling yourself, how you're dealing with this event. And, um, you know, sometimes those stories can be helpful um, and sometimes the stories we construct cannot be so uh, helpful. And so the goal is to help a patient find a story together, create, collaborate together on a story that will be more adaptive. But this is kind of bread and butter psychotherapy. You know, the, there's the sort of a, most common kind of story is that people might perceive themselves as victims of events and you might want to rescript towards more of a survivor story. Um, I, a friend of mine lost a baby to SIDS and, you know, of course, what any mother might do is start wondering if they had done something wrong, if they had you know, if it was because they were co-sleeping or this or that, or were they not attentive enough? Um, and while who knows where, where the truth is in any of that, but, you know, what would be a more adaptive story to help this person cope? Well, the story that this is a random act of tragedy, right? Um, and nobody really understands what causes SIDS. There are some risks for that, but the literature is complicated. Yes, co-sleeping is associated with SIDS, but most of the co-sleeping studies are in people that are, um, uh, you know, living um, with uh, limited resources. So, you know, working with somebody like that, if I were to work with somebody like that, I might, you know, try to rescript them towards this random act of tragedy story. And this happens with many losses, right? A lot of people come to us for psychotherapy with losses and reframing um, bringing meaning to that loss, you know, it might not be, people might have thoughts like, oh, you know, this person died because I wasn't, you know, uh, a a good Christian or I wasn't, or I should, you know, because of some failing of mine or um, whatever. They can give all kinds of unhelpful uh, meaning to the, a a random act of tragedy. So um, again, I think, uh, the life story perspective, if that's sort of the origin of the person's problems, looking at the interaction of that and personality, um, which does can color the uh, strength of a reaction to an event, and then helping them craft a story collaboratively, tentatively, um, that will help them move forward um, and find some healing. Uh, from that uh, encounter. That's the idea of the life story perspective. Yes, I like that a lot. And uh, I agree. It it is, um, there's a lot of psychotherapies that are attempting to do that. And uh, like with the trauma one, like you said, like some people 
they go through something and it's not the big event that is the traumatic event for them. It's something that maybe somebody else would say is, wow, that wasn't, that didn't seem like that big of a deal, but to them, it impacted them because where their mind was at the time, you know, and, and, you know, going into fight, flight, freeze, it's it dependent on the person. Um, and then right there, our mind usually quick, quickly makes up a story. And so oftentimes psychotherapy is unwinding that story, reframing that story while in some psychotherapy, like EMDR therapy, re actually going back and looking at the event that we don't want to think about and seeing a slightly, uh, I would call a, a zoomed out perspective instead of the first person, kind of a third person perspective and being able to sort of weave that into our narrative because the hard part about mental health is that if we can accept the difficult parts of our lives that are not what we wanted and missed our expectations and aren't the story we would have told, then we can feel whole. But if we try to excise those difficult stories and, and, and shun them into the basement or under the floorboards or cut them off, we, you will feel a nagging or a, or a, a void or a, I don't know, dis, um, sort of ambivalence or, or whatever about various factors of your life. And that can be unsettling. Um, that's just very, a very general point, but I think it is important for people out there who are listening to understand, and this is throughout your book, which is if you take some action, um, whether it be engaging in treatment, uh, getting involved with different friends or <laughs> different people that in your life or different communities, then what is going on right now um, over time, especially if you keep seeking and don't give up, and that's the big word, don't give up, things will change for you. And especially, you know, like with this big word recovery, what is that? Recovery for mental illness, you know, but things will change when you, if you engage over time. And also if you believe the research, which is all there, which is great. We don't have to, this isn't, we're not back in the Freud and Jung debates anymore. We have the research. It shows that it works, but it does take experience and participation. Uh, and finding practitioners that you feel align with those values, that that look at you like a whole person, that are invested in your healing, not in just your maintenance. Um, and so I, I love that that tone is what you're striking throughout uh, the writings that you've that you've done, especially in your book Survive, from Survive to Thrive. Um, yeah, anything that maybe you want the listeners to hear or something maybe I left out in my questioning? Well, I, I will just say that in the book, I do share my own story of postpartum depression um, as well as uh, and use that to illustrate several of the perspectives as well as cases of uh, other uh, other cases of people that I've treated. Um, and I also talk about my own uh, brother's suicide. So um, not only do I have professional experience with um, mental illness, um, but also I have the uh, the personal experience. Um, and I think that that even before the uh, personal events in my life, um, obviously I was a psychiatrist before then, and um, Hold on, I'm logged out here. I have to re-log back in. Oh, you're fine. Okay. Uh, even uh, before the the uh, my personal uh, encounters with uh, psychiatric illness, uh, I had my professional work um, and was very, you know, empathic and uh, felt like I was doing a great job. But it's those personal experiences that kind of even deepened the empathy I have for other people and again, um, strengthen my advocacy so that throughout the medical system, any uh, person, um, regardless of their illness, would be treated with respect and dignity. Because I saw firsthand 
um, you know, how not only I was treated, but also uh, how my brother was treated in the in the healthcare system. And, you know, this isn't um, unique to our stories. There are plenty of people who, um, you know, have done a lot of work in this area to, to show that people with uh, severe mental illness uh, have a shortened lifespan, mm-hmm. by a substantially shortened lifespan by anywhere from 15 to 25 years. So um, it's really critically important uh, that all of our patients um, are given uh, the respect and dignity they deserve and are treated as people. Yes, that is well said. I appreciate you you sharing those personal anecdotes. And I know in the book you go into much more detail about them. And it is important because especially in in any part of healthcare, but in mental health and dealing with that, we're talking about somebody's life. And I think that's important for clinicians to have a practice every day to remember why they're in this field and that the stakes are high. And um, we should do due diligence and not assume things, which is you know, one of the things people do when they work over and over and over, we see that the, we call, I don't know, I call that the drift from protocol. Um, we drift in our, and, and, and I think that's important to remember that and going through those things yourself, you, you see the impact of that. And, um, so also one of the things, my favorite little thing to say for psychotherapist is, are you in psychotherapy at least several months per year, if not all year, <laughs> you know, as a provider, are you doing these, are you doing self practices so that you can reflect so that you don't lose your perspective of other people's humanity just because they're suffering. And this is your job. Um, it's, it's really, it's really, it's just vital. I mean, that makes the difference. I mean, we see that in the research on counseling that on, in the common factors of what what we saw with the treatment effect, that rapport was like 60% allegiant and the relationship is basically 90%, but there's three parts of the relationship that made up 91% of the treatment effect. And it was the relationship and the rapport, the person believes in the methods you're utilizing. And I think that they understand what you're utilizing and that they believe that that might help them. And that was, and then the other eight to nine percent are actually the techniques you used. <laughs> so, and yeah, no, I I totally agree with that. I was trained in psychotherapy by Jerome Frank, who was wrote this book Persuasion and Healing, and talked about these common uh, factors to all successful psychotherapies. And I think the ones he identified, he he started, he was joined the faculty in 1941, so he was around a long time. I was lucky to have overlapped with him. But, um, you know, he saw these factors as healer status, some level of direction on the part of the therapist, not complete silence, some uh, amount of emotional arousal in the patient, specifically uh, the emotion aroused of hope, um, and some kind of ritual, um, you know, in, in Western psychiatry, it's the whatever, the 50 minute hour or whatever. Mm -hmm. But those were some of the non-specific factors. And and again, they were very much relationship based. Um, There was something I was going to say to what you had said. Now I lost my uh, train of thought, but it. um, Oh, so, you know, one of the things that um, I like about the perspectives approach is that it's a very systematic approach. So. It protects against kind of sliding into sloppiness <laughs> mm-hmm. and um, kind of getting into a, a kind of assumptions about patients um, because it requires you to go through each, you know, not only take this comprehensive history of everyone and do this thorough mental status examination, every visit of everyone, (laughs) always the same questions so that you're not assuming, oh, I don't have to ask about suicide this time. I mean, I saw a patient today that I've seen for 30 years. He hasn't been suicidal in at least 10 years. I still asked him (laughs) any morbid thoughts, thoughts of suicide. Um, So just doing that in every patient, but also going through every patient 
thinking, you know, how much of this is from, and documenting how much you think this is from their life story, how much of this is uh, explained by their personality, how much is explained by anything that they're doing, a behavior, how much is explained by a disease with every patient. So I think that way it protects against thinking, oh yeah, I've seen one person with major depressive disorder. This looks just like major depressive disorder. You know, I don't need to ask those other questions. I don't need to think about these other aspects of of the person. I think um, what I'm hearing that is there's a very high standard of a protocol and the protocol protects. Um, It reminds me of the book Freakonomics, which talked about Cook County in Chicago's cardiac unit that was assessing for heart for heart attacks and how at one point they were missing like 30 or 40 percent, like sending people home and people were dying. And then somebody came in and said, wait a minute. We've drifted from the research and they they said, ask this, do this, do that, do that. And then when they did that, uh, their efficacy rate of catching heart attacks in the emergency room was like 98% just after implementing that protocol. So I'm, I am very, um, I, I have a lot of admiration for the Johns Hopkins model. I hope that that's something that will spread throughout psychiatry. It reminds me of uh, the informed treatment model uh, by Scott Miller in the psychotherapy, where you kind of, you give the client a questionnaire, uh, that they fill out about, uh, did they, did they get to talk about what they want to talk about? Did they get what they got? Um, what could the therapist do better? What did the therapist do well? And, and you sort of take that uh, feedback informed treatment. Yes. Model. And you take that and then that just deepens the trust in the relationship. Uh, and it also helps the therapist understand what this client needs that even if they have similar symptoms to another client, they may not need that. And, and that's, uh, and that gives the client uh, power to sort of determine like, Hey, I'm, I'm participating in this. I'm not just waiting for you to tell me <laughs> what to do. I want to tell you what I think worked. And because you did this yeah. last time, you didn't do that this time. So um, I think that no, it's funny because model. I, it's funny because I, um, at the end, so I, you know, we have this very long history. It usually takes at least an hour, at least an hour to ask all the questions. I give a role induction to the patient. It's going to be, you know, a lot of questions. I'm going to start with the family history. I'm going to move forward in time because I want to put whatever's going on now in the context of who you are as a person, your life. After an hour of questions, I will say, is there anything that I didn't ask that you think is important for me to know. Usually they laugh because it's like, <laughs> you've asked everything, but at least it gives an opportunity. And then I all when I give my formulation, which is running through the perspectives and talking about that and what I how I think what they're doing fits into that model. Um, I'll say, you know, this would be my recommendation of how to kind of approach things but what do you think of that <laughs> i mean i think you really want to engage your patients in their treatment plan um it's not going to work unless they're engaged right um and you know i often got patients when i was in private practice they came to me and the very first thing they said they're seeing a psychiatrist the very first thing they said is i don't want medication i'm like okay i took my whole history I then would say, okay, I know you don't want medication, so let's move to some other options. Oh, no, no, that's okay. If you think I need medication, (laughs) that's fine. Only because I didn't, I gave them that option. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't going to, you know, I was going to honor what they had said at the beginning. But by that time, I don't know, they had come around to think, well, if I've asked all those questions and this is my recommendation, I'll go for it. Come to find out, I couldn't figure out why I was getting all these patients. I was on the list at Hopkins for people that would call Hopkins saying I wanted to see a doctor who was willing to not prescribe medication. That's why I was getting all those (laughs) patients. I thought it was just nobody wanted to be on medication, but I couldn't understand why you'd come to a psychiatrist then. Right. So anyway, um, but I do think, uh, you know, having the patient engaged as a partner in their care is essential. Yes, I agree. I, I think that 
also it there's so many things you could say about that but it, it engen- engenders trust and empowers the patient and also it takes it, it can empower them even further to think about that they may be able to start i don't know being more in charge of their health and that the doctor is a guide and the therapist is a guide but that i need to take control of my health and that's a cultural whole bag we could open but um when people feel that they are taking control of their health and getting involved and reading articles and thinking about what they're eating and thinking about exercise and going that that extra um mile in their own thinking about themselves and their lives that all all of a sudden we're into preventative medicine and then that prevents people from seeing us which is <laughs> which is good for society, I guess. Um, no, I couldn't agree more. I think that, you know, this is, this is, I think, crucial to um, helping people uh, have agency. Um, you know, this comes up in psychotherapy all the time where a patient will say, you know, ask for my advice. <laughs> I usually, I use humor a lot. I'm like, look, I have enough trouble just managing my own life and tell me knowing what I should do, much less I'm not going to presume to know what you should do. But the real reason is, you know, if I say something, you know, and give some advice and you do it and it goes well, you're not going to be able to take the credit for it. And if it goes poorly, you're just going to blame me. So neither of those are good options. You know, I want you know, let's just try to figure out, you know, what you want to do and we'll try it. It'll be an experiment. You'll see if it goes well. And if so, you can, you can learn from that and pat yourself on the back if it goes well. Agency is key. Yes, it, exactly. And it, like you said, it's a risk to give advice. And in, in psychotherapy in counseling, it was one of my classes. I remember this, was like <laughs> one of the first one-on-one classes. They said, we are not in the business of giving advice <laughs> and and a lot of people it was their first you know one of their first classes and some of them had been um school teachers you know um, they were switching careers and they said what what are we supposed to do then <laughs> what are we doing what are we even here for like why and you know of course it was we explained and over the course of the class we we practiced um where we did like a, a bad role play and a good role play. In the bad role play, you were supposed to assume things and give advice to the client who was your fellow student. And in the in the good role play, you were supposed to listen and hear hints and make suggestions and ask permission. Uh, what do you think? What would you say if I said that maybe going to bed at midnight instead of three was uh, might be helpful for work? Well, if you said that, I might I might be okay with that. But actually, I think that's a good idea. That's my idea. You know, giving them right. uh, or or what do you think you should do about your smoking habit? What's your perspective on smoking? You know, instead of saying, well, you need to quit smoking right now. And it was funny because those same people that were in an uproar the first day of class learned as soon as they were the role play fake patient that that advice giving was was a turnoff i don't want to yeah. talk to this person they just judged me and told me what to do with my life right. and, that, and so how offensive that can be to give advice um especially when someone hasn't asked for it. but even if they do ask for it how dangerous it can be because you don't we don't have a camera we're not going home we're not in your mind we we don't know uh, right. ultimately what will give you meaning and purpose so i i think that takes um, uh, a great deal of humility, especially for somebody who's a doctor who's gone through, I don't know, what do you go through? Eight years of school and two years of residency or something like that, uh, or three years of residency. Four and four. <laughs> yeah, four and four. And, and, you know, to be, I am the expert, okay? I, I know about this, but yet here I, you know, we have to have that, we, we have to maintain humility uh, so that we're not a dictator of, of the treatment. We're the provider and the and the recommender of of, of treatment yeah. and the guide. So yeah. So I admire that uh in your perspective. So yeah, I I've, I've had a great time talking to you. Is there anything I left out that you wanted to say before we're departing? No, I think that this has been a wonderful hour or more of chatting. <laughs> so thank you very much for all your great questions. And I'm going to put the link to how people can find 
uh, this book in the notes and in the blog that will follow uh, the publication of this podcast. Is there any other resources um, that you want me to include? Hopkins Psychiatry does have a website. Okay, yes. So people would always go there if they they want to learn more about uh, Hopkins Psychiatry and um, and their resources there as well for patients okay, yeah. and families. I will uh, I will look that up for our listeners, and I will put that in the notes. We are now ranked for several years. I think been ranked number one in departments of psychiatry in the U.S. News and World Reports uh, evaluation of hospitals. So that we do know awesome. something. Congratulations. <laughs> well, I can, I can see it's, it's showing, it's showing through this interview. So I appreciate your time. I'll throw that link in there so people can see the resources and all and, and everything you're doing there at Johns Hopkins, as well as your book. And uh, thank you so much. Thanks. It was great talking with you. And there you have it. This has been another episode of the Intentional Clinician Podcast with Paul Kraus. If you are enjoying the show, please share it with people you know. I would surely appreciate it. If you are looking for an EMDR, International Association Consultant, I am almost a full consultant, and I am now a consultant in training, and I am providing hours weekly for people that want to join the group. We have a group every Wednesday online, and you can check out the details at counselingsupervisorgr.com or healthforlifegr.com or just send me an email. If you are in need of counseling, do not hesitate to make an appointment with a local counselor in your area. You can make an appointment with the excellent clinicians in Grand Rapids at Health for Life Counseling Grand Rapids and now Ada, Michigan and the Trauma-Informed Counseling Center of Grand Rapids which is all under the same website at www.healthforlifegr.com That's healthforlifegr.com The recording you just listened to consists of the personal opinions of Paul Krauss and his guest, and while these are based upon literature and their experience in the field, these should not be viewed as the definitive opinion on any subject. Listening to this podcast is not a substitute for treatment. If you are in a crisis, please dial 911 or the National Suicide Prevention Line at 1-800-273-8255. Are you a young person of color feeling down, stressed out, or overwhelmed? Text the word STEVE to 741741 and a live trained crisis counselor will respond. Did you know you could support your local bookstore by shopping at bookshop.org? You can order a book from the comfort of your own home while still supporting a brick and mortar local business near you. If you are not a member of a local counseling organization and you are a counselor, please consider joining. There are a lot of things that happen behind the scenes at the state and federal level. And if you are not a member of your local counseling association, there are things that will happen without your permission. We need to stay vigilant to make sure that quality mental health services are available in each state. Mental health education is put in schools, that we have best practices among the healthcare professionals in our states and making sure that we keep licensed professional counselors and other therapists accessible by the public. In Michigan, we have the Michigan Mental Health Counselors Association, which I recommend, and in Arizona, the Arizona Counselors Association. Please look up what's in your field. And again, if you want to be trained in EMDR therapy, check out the link for EMDR Training Solutions and put the code INTENTIONAL at the checkout for $100 off. All right, until next time. I'm wishing you all a safe and peaceful week.